So let's get started. Um, so I can see we have people from Argentina, from Ghana, from Sunshine Coast, Canberra, Victoria. I'm in Brisbane, so welcome everyone. This is exciting. So first, let me introduce ourselves. So Fran and I are um, the co-founders of Value Learning. Uh, I'm Marcela Lapertosa. This is Fran Baxter. Fran is in Sydney. And we both come from uh, more than 20 years of experience in the exchange programs uh, world, especially with mobility programs. So we worked for AFS for many years. That's what Satoshi did his program with, and so did Eloise. Um, maybe someone else here. Um, but um, during that time, our main focus was on how to help these people who went to spend six months a year in another country to develop their intercultural competence. We were both in the field of education within AFS more than about moving people. And what happened to us uh, in the last year is what happened to everyone, right? COVID came along and we were like, what do we do now that we don't have bodies to move? Um, although we had been branching into school workshops and professional development, that was a very small part of what we did in, in the big uh, context of mobility programs. And for all of you who are involved in international education, you know that the volume took away the focus a lot of the times um, from, from the value, right? And that's where we were. So we found ourselves working on developing online exchange programs. And to be honest, at the beginning, we were like, is this even possible, right? Uh, how are we gonna create those life-changing experiences connecting on Zoom? And in the last few months, we, we have developed or co-developed these three programs. One was the Australian Indonesia Youth Exchange Program, which was a seven week program, which is a traditional program that had been running for 39 years. And some of you are very familiar with it here. We have also worked with the ASEAN Australia Youth Strategic Project on the Break the Chain Program, um, which brings people from um, all the ASEAN countries and Australia. So 40 young people from the region. And we are now working with IES abroad with a group of Japanese students uh, doing an exchange program in Australia or online in Australia. So these three programs really brought a lot of learning to us and we wanted to share on this webinar today. We'll have time at the end for questions, but if you have any questions during the program, just write it on the chat or any comments and we'll just, um, we can answer it on the go uh, if possible. Also, if you have any comments, uh, just feel free to go ahead. So what we are gonna be doing today is we want to of course highlight the advantages of virtual programs. We want to discuss the common concerns around virtual programs, the common resistance that we find, um, how to develop intercultural competence online. We'll also introduce a four step um, process to a successful program design. And we will share some meaningful, some ways to foster meaningful online connections and some activities and approaches. Of course, in one hour, we can't share everything, but we'll give you a bit of a glimpse into some of the things that we've done to get you inspired. So, but let's start with the most obvious things. So what are the advantages of virtual exchange programs? I would love for you to pop it on the chat now. This should be easy, I hope. For you, what are the advantages of a virtual exchange program? I know we were forced into this by COVID, but there are many advantages to it. Yes, scalability, multiple locations. Yes, Ellie. Yeah. <laughs> lockdown won't stop you from running your program. Exactly, we can have snap lockdowns thousand times during the year and we will be still doing good work. Fantastic event. Anything else? It's Flexibility. What, what was that? Sorry, more affordable for people. More affordable, exactly, yes. Flexibility, it's free, yeah. Okay, yes, it's inclusive. First of all, we can reach to every person in regional Australia, in every corner of the country, people who might not be able to get on a plane that they can get online. Um, people who work full time, and would never go on a, on, on a program overseas um, or who have kids. So that's the first thing that we, we've seen with these programs. It's low cost, you've already said it's scalable, exactly. Why sending 50 when we can connect 500 online? Um, it's flexible, we can work around it, we can do it in many different ways. And it has a bigger reach. That's another thing that we've found with these programs is if you're running a program in Brisbane, you might only have access to speakers or 
institutions in Brisbane. Or if you want to bring someone from somewhere else, it will be super expensive or they won't even do it. With an online program, you can tap into every expert in the world and they will be willing to get online for half an hour, no problem. Um, every person we've reached out to ask for, to come to do a, a keynote speak or, or to do a workshop, because they're from doing it from their home and it's only half an hour or an hour, they're always available. So the, the reach is amazing. So, and then another thing that we want to talk to you about is intercultural competence, right? As most of you, I know most of you in this call already know it, <laughs> Intercultural competence is the ability to interact effectively and appropriately with those who are different to you. Effective is because you achieve your goals and appropriate you do it in a way that is respectful of the values of the other person, right? And at the heart of international education, there is this belief that you have to spend time in another country for a long period of time to be able to develop that intercultural competence, right? We are gonna talk about that later on a bit more, but that, that is the belief. You spend six months or a year in a program and you're intercultural competent. So we were like, how are we gonna do that in seven weeks or four weeks online? And let me tell you, we did it. So we use the intercultural effectiveness scale. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but we tested uh, the group at the beginning and just focus on these numbers here. So the, the intercultural effectiveness scale measures three main dimensions, continuous learning, personal, interpersonal engagement and hardiness, and it gives an overall number at the end. So when we started, these are two different groups. The first group had three people in the low part side of the scale and three on the high. The other group had only one on the, on the low um, side of the, the scale and six and three on the high. So let me show you where they are seven weeks later. So the group that only had, remember, the first group only had three people on high, now have seven. And I'm gonna go back again. This group had six and three on the high, now have three and nine. We went from three people on the highest point of the scale of intercultural effectiveness to nine. Um, for those who are into research, you might have a lot of questions about this tool, but we can answer those later. But this is a very strong validated tool that is used in international education. And we were surprised by the results ourselves. Like, and we compare it to the last two years when we did this program in person and the results were better this time than the last two years. So something happened online that didn't happen with, the in, with two months in-country experience. So how did we do it? You might be wondering. <laughs> Um, so let's, uh, I'll, I'm going to hand it over to Fran, who's been a bit sick and his voice might disappear. And if it does, I'll take over. <laughs> but I'll hand it over to you, Fran. Perfect. Well, hi, everyone. And as you can hear, I have a, um, I've woken up with a very scratchy and sore throat. So apologies. Um, and if you can't understand um, me, please um, pop it in the chat and Marcella will take back over. So how do we do it? I think the very first and most important thing is that we had a vision. So we really had a, um, a belief that this was possible and that you could, in fact, um, conduct effective um, exchange, effective intercultural um, competence growth in an online um, program. Um, one of our challenges, of course, then became, well, how do we firstly identify ourselves, um, how to make this happen, how to make it happen effectively, and then how do we overcome some of the concerns or barriers um, that may be in place that stop, um, that stop us moving forward? So we had um, to clear those concerns and we had to, first of all, of course, identify, you know, where were, the, where were they coming from? So we had our own, we had some of our own concerns. So yes, we're very um, motivated and we're very kind of uh, optimistic. So we did have that vision and we knew that it could happen, but we also had a few concerns that we needed to, to overcome ourselves. Then we had to think about the other stakeholders um, uh, the organisations in each case that were putting it together, what were their needs, or where, were, where was their tolerance for uncertainty. 
Um, and then, of course, the potential participants. What kind of concerns would potential participants on a virtual program um, bring and what would uh, stop them getting engaged? So we want you to think about this. We're going to pop up a, a quick poll. Which of these concerns do you have you faced or resistance? Now, this might be stuff that you hold within yourself. You might think, oh, look, I just don't think this is, uh, you know, it's possible to retain interest online. It could be what you've heard others say, or it could be what you think might happen. So give us an idea about retaining interest online. Yeah. yeah. Others. Yeah. Online yeah. is not as good. Perfect. So yeah. both, I guess both are coming through because I can't see it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. We've got participants good. Um, cannot learn without immersion. That's probably the front runner at the moment. Uh, four people say that. Three, online is not as good and you cannot retain okay. interest online. Okay. okay. Here are the results. Can you see them? Yeah. I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw someone nodding. Can. Perfect. Okay. All right. So we want to have um, to just give a few key points. Oh, yeah, you faced all of them. Yeah, I think we faced <laughs> them all too. <laughs> so we want to just go through some of these um, concerns or resistance and, um, and give you a bit of an idea of, of how we handle that. So this idea that it's not the real program, uh, that it's a substitute, a poor substitute at that, or that in some way, um, there's a feeling of missing out. It was really important for us to address that. And um, one of the things we did right from the start was really promote it as the real program. We tried to avoid getting into that conversation about what was missing um, and focusing on the value, focusing on the inclusions, focusing on what this program was. Um, and that was actually quite um, successful. Um, it, very early on, there was a bit of pushback, especially from participants that had, like alumni, people that had been on um, some of these programs in the past um, and, uh, you know, kind of could remember some of the in-person activities and um, the feeling of that and found it difficult to, to believe that you could some, uh, that you could achieve those outcomes, but really being very upfront about this is the program, this is what we're doing, it's exciting, it's real, you know, it, you, you, the learning will occur. So there was a certain sense of, um, you know, positivity in all the messaging. Yeah, and important to note in those, all these three programs, the number of applications for the program were never less than when the program was in person. So that's also very, very interesting to, to observe. Yeah, that's true. Um, and you cannot learn without immersion. So this is an area that we've um, uh, quite experienced in as far as the global competence um, realm. And one of the things that much of the research um, shows us is that um, it's not just about immersion. Um, clearly, uh, being in close contact with um, others is, is important, but it's not the main area where the learning takes place. I'm sure all of us at some time have also experienced um, having um, interactions or travel or even an experience like this where um, you've watched um, some of the participants not gain the learning that you would have hoped for. So in, in turn, we really um, looked at that research and applied the key learning. The first thing is that it needs to be, um, there needs to be a very intentional program and, and regular reflection. It's an experiential um, learning model and the reflection or the meaning making is the most critical part of the learning. It also um, needs skill facilitation. Without the guidance um, through the program, and look, this is whether it's in person or not, um, you will not achieve the outcomes. And the other is providing that cultural content. So on a new uh, program that might be in person, yes, you may be in that cultural content. Um, in a virtual program, you need to provide the cultural content to ensure that the learners um, have something to reflect on. Um, what we looked here um, to do is that we under, 
pin the programs um, with a solid online learning program. Uh, so for the Australia Indonesia program, we use the Global Competence Certificate, which is um, goes through a series of modules, quite an extensive program. And that became uh, part of the core learning. And we linked all the other elements of the program, which were quite extensive, to that Global Competence Certificate. And it required um, participants to really engage in looking at those key areas of um, global competence and then reflecting on them, interacting in a forum. And this was exceptionally um, successful. Um, there was a lot of interaction. Uh, there was in fact, it increased over time. So there was, um, as the participants built their confidence with each other, you could see that they were exploring deeply. With the Break the Chain program, we designed and developed a four module um, program specifically for them. Um, and in this case, the core program was around um, human trafficking and modern slavery. Our part of this program was to help them to work together effectively in multicultural teams. So our program before their program um, enabled them to build that competence. And um, again, it was very successful and had a very strong area of both a cultural component, the skill facilitation and um, uh, the intentional reflection. And just important to note here, Fran, is that you don't need huge technology for this. For the Break the Chain no. program, we're just using a closed Facebook group where we post the modules. You can have a course in, in there and then Zoom, we're using all the courses, all the programs we use Zoom um, as a, the, the platform to meet. I think one of the other things that we've certainly heard is how can you achieve the outcomes? We wanted to run these programs in a way that had very, um, clearly defined um, outcomes in, um, of course, like all programs, um, but especially with the one that had been running um, in person for 39 years, it was really for us very critical and I think for the organisations and uh, themselves to ensure that that sense of why that program existed um, wasn't lost. You know, the sense of building um, strong understanding of the bilateral relationship um, building um, long-term friendships um, that could be sustained beyond the program and um, building the cultural understanding, the intercultural understanding of each other's country was critical. So it was essential to really effectively plan um, to support the program and to have a whole range of activities which were connected to the expected outcomes. This is not different to any kind of programming, but it's easy to see at times how you can get off the track and lose sight of what the goals are. We had very clear goals in mind right from the start and every activity was purposeful and intentional um, towards achieving those goals. And whether that was the fun activities, the games nights or, um, you know, the online learning, it all led towards um, very clearly defined outcomes. And finally, um, and I noticed it come up, um, you know, in our in our survey, and um, I have to say it was my biggest worry is that you can't retain interest. Um, in a, you know, in-person uh, mobility program, somebody travels overseas, they're not just gonna pack their bag and go home, well, not very often, um, if they lose interest. Uh, but online, of course, you know, the risk was, what if they stop showing up? Um, you know, what, what if they show up, but they're not present um, or, you know, not, not engaged in the program. So this was really a worry for us. Um, and I'm sure, as we saw from the survey, a rough worry for you as well. Um, so there was a couple of things that we looked at here. First was um, clear expectations, actually clear expectations for timing involved as well. Um, you know, what was expected, um, what was realistic um, and and making sure that that was communicated early um, and often. Um, keep being online for short periods of time. We found that for the most of our activities, um, they were either 60 minutes, 90 minutes, um, or on a couple of very highly structured activities, um, they were for two hours, but definitely nothing beyond that. In fact, most were 60 or 90 minutes. Um, 
ensuring that there was a variety of activities and format um, and ensuring that it in every activity there was it was interactive um, so it wasn't um, one way conversation and and finally we increased the participant the participants role in the program so being conscious of you know allowing time at the start for establishing connections for feeling safe and secure for kind of knowing how everything was working but over time and fairly quickly we started to in encourage and engage the participants in taking on additional roles, hosting um, the speaker series, for instance, or in engaging in some of the reflection activities in a more leadership role. Um, and this was very well received, um, both as a learning experience in their own right, in its own right, but also to um, retain um, the engagement. We had a very, very high success rate um, across um, both of the uh, programs that we've completed recently um, around engagement. Uh, there were no dropouts of people, there was no um, lacking of um, attention, and you could see from the interactions, um, both in both casually through our WhatsApp group that we had, but also in the learning areas um, that the participants were engaged. Good. Which takes us to my buddy. Yes, so just hold for a couple of minutes here if any questions so far before we jump into the, the four steps. If anyone has any questions, you can put it in the chat or just unmute yourself. Can you talk a little bit about the model you used, like how often people met and how long it went for and things like that? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm gonna talk about it soon. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we're yeah. coming to it. But it's a good question. Right, so we'll and there was a lot of a lot of interaction and required a fair bit of effort on our part too. Yes. Yeah, I'm gonna talk about that when we talk about the planning. And Tracy, and please ask me more there if it's not enough or what you expected. No worries, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Otherwise we keep moving and then we have more time at the end. But these are the four, we call it the four steps for success. Again, you've seen this before. There's nothing new about it, it's not rocket science, um, but it's one of those things that you just see on a piece of paper and then kind of get carried away with, oh, I saw these activities, exciting, I'll put it here, right? Without giving it much thought or how that, does that link to your goals? So let's start with the planning. Number one, clear goals. Every program has different goals. So be very intentional about it and, and have them at the front of everything every time you're planning for the activities or you're facilitating a session keep thinking the, about the goals the other thing is the timing and tracy and we're, we're getting there so think about time zones uh, number one we had different very different time zones so we had to allow for that how long every day are you going to have people connected um how many times a week um, what time of the year are you going to do this program? You know, these are all things that you need to think about when you are involving people from different countries. The other thing is the sequencing. What goes first? What goes last? And it's very important. We had, the, the, like Fran said, in both programs, we have the, the underlying, the global competence certificate or the, the Break the Chain program. So, for example, there is a module online which is about uh, spiritual diversity. So, we did a session after that module about religious uh, diversity. So we brought people from different religions and we had a live conversation. We broke out into groups for them to talk to the speakers. We rotated the speakers into smaller groups. So they did the learning online, like watching a video, discussing in the forum, they understood the concepts. And then after that, we did a live session um, for them to deepen their knowledge. So most of our activities looked like that. So we had an online piece followed by live sessions, followed by reflections. Another thing that is very important is the opening and the closing. For those who have read the book, uh, The Art of Gathering by Priya Parker, if you haven't read it, I recommend it. The Art of Gathering by Priya Parker. She's amazing and she talks about why we gather. And it doesn't matter if it's in person or in line, if it's baby shower or conference. 
but she says that the opening and the closing are very important. It has to be significant. It has to show that something's starting. It has to get people excited about this. That, that keeps your, your attention and your motivation at the beginning of the program. And towards the end, you have to give people time to mourn. You have, people are sad at the end of the program, even if when it's online. You need to make sure you have the ritual in place to allow for that reflection and to celebrate the end of that program. So Tracy, and this is pretty much what the, the program looked like. So we had an opening and a closing. So the beginning of the program, the first week, of course, we had a, a fancy opening ceremony with big speakers, but we also had a few sessions related to the opening, which is about setting expectations, getting to know each other, a few fun activities to kind of warm up the group to each other, right? There was 40 people in the room. Um, and then the first part of activities was the internships. So three weeks of internships. And then the last three weeks was a social impact project where they had to work together choosing one of the sustainable development goals and developing a project for that. And the speaker series was underlined the whole seven weeks. So the type of speakers that we had each week depended on what was happening for the participants. So for example, around internship, we would have speakers around workplace culture, discussing the difference between working in Australia and in another country. Um, so giving the participants the tools to do that, to, to give them the skill to um, be able to perform. And when it was about the social impact project, it was about, we had some lab skill, uh, skills lab, sorry, which was about how to set goals, how to project manage, how to pitch your project. Um, and speakers that looked at some of the SDGs like gender equality, which was a really um, highly valued um, session or um, uh, just a general overview of the SDGs in gen uh, by you know a really renowned speaker as well. So kind of building that capacity or a youth forum where young people who had developed projects um, were able to come together in a forum to speak about what they've done. So that was exceptionally motivated for our young uh, people to recognise, oh, we could be doing this. And it just gave lots of ideas. Yeah. So what we did pretty much, it was about, we had activities every day, Monday to, sat to Saturday included. <laughs> And it was uh, between one and two hours every day uh, when we were connected on Zoom, right? Uh, a couple of days, I'm gonna talk a bit more in the next one. We had a two hour session because what, there were special workshops. I'm gonna talk about that now, but pretty much. And then every week at the end of the week, we had a reflection session to bring everything together. We talked about this earlier, making meaning of the experience. So it wasn't just about bombarding them with content, but allowing for the time to process that and plan them for the next week. That happened every week. And then, oh, there's a comment there. Let me check. Oh, oh Yvette, oh, you wrote, wrote to me. You're anxious about a new workshop you're doing. You're gonna be fine. Let us know if you want to talk to us after this webinar to give you another hand with that project. So implementing, there's two things you need to consider, your approach and your activities. The approach, we are not gonna get tired of saying it, it needs to be intentional. Intention, everything you do has to be intentional. What we noticed with Fran, to be honest, there was one thing that wasn't intentional in our program and of course brought no out outcomes. <laughs> and it was around language. So we, didn't, so we thought, oh yeah, you know, they're going to improve their language because they're interacting. You're going to spend some time. Oh, there is this event if you want to go on Sunday to improve your intonation or your English. You know what? It was not intentional and it didn't bring much improvement. Yes, they, they learn a few words here and there, but it doesn't show the level of improvement that shows other areas uh, show. And the other thing is it has to be experiential. Experiential learning, for those who are into education know what it is, but it is about not only having the experience, but then having the reflection to make sense about the experience and then the opportunity to apply that learning. And that cycle starts again every time, right? So our program was built on that. So they, they had an experience of talking to a speaker, then they used that, that knowledge in their projects, then they got feedback, reflected on that and improved that. So that, that's, that's very important in every project that you do. Of course, it has to be participant center and hands-on. And let me tell you, we were hands-on. So you have to have your WhatsApp group or your WeChat group if it's with China. 
and you know you have to interact you have, and and this is I'm a psychologist and and but you don't have to be a psychologist to know that when people respond to your messages you're more motivated to keep answering and to keep participating so even in on forums how many programs have a forum for, for people to comment on and there's no facilitator commenting on the comments so people lose interest so you have to comment on the forum you have to encourage people you need to send messages on whatsapp you have to be hands-on and a variety of activities look we did a business hackathon that was the two hours using design thinking we brought different businesses from the two countries to find a solution in two hours we did a design sprint to choose the social impact project which was also two hours but we did youth forums we did what else uh, cooking lessons we didn't run the cooking lessons ourselves but the variety of activities that we did was endless and we when we did the speaker series was a variety of a one keynote with five a panel of five people or also for the participants the highlight was having the chance to go into breakout rooms with individual speakers after the sessions so the panel would speak for half an hour and then if we had four speakers we would create four four rooms and then we rotate the speakers in at least once participants love that the you don't have the opportunity in a, in a conference with 500 people and these were high quality speakers that we could tap into because it was online. Um, and then activities to foster mutual understanding and curiosity. And this goes in any setting in any type of program. One that we love, this is just an example, is partner activities. So partner participants, get them into couples. Um, and you can do that in any program, a parents program, student program, exchange program, and get them to work on something together. So this is just two examples of the like 10 activities that we had. But one is about, the, about their identities. So they had an online module about social identities. And, and after that module, they all, the couples got this um, worksheet that they had to complete with their different identities and then discuss with each other, find similarities and differences. That really gets, helps you get to know the other person. It's quite a deep, activity it doesn't look like it but it's very deep uh, it allows for great conversation goes into family religion gender and then the other one is very simple but very effective mapping your home so everyone draws a map of the, their home they share with each other but the most important thing is what does that map tell you about your values mm. about how people live about how people interact what's important what's not so important in that family and the beauty of some of these activities that they work in high school, they work in university, they work with adults, um, you know, uh, beyond um, beyond university or um, higher education. So there's lots of application in lots of different settings. You might change a few of the, you know, things that they discuss, but in general, the principles are the same and, and very effective. But it was also part of that really key to trying to establish close relationships. So the program had a goal around ongoing relationships, around, you know, being able to develop a network that was going to last well beyond the program. Um, so you needed some uh, activities to really help foster that. Um, and some of those things were the ones that we organised ourselves. But over time, the participants themselves started doing stuff, you know, having Netflix nights and um, you know doing all kinds of fun activities themselves um, and that's when you know that those relationships are, are forming and forming effectively yeah playing video games watching movies together they were big they were eager to finish the, the activity that we had because they have their own planned after so that was yeah that was amazing and we've tried these activities with all age groups. You adapt it slightly for each uh, group, or but they work. So then about facilitation, I want to ask you what makes for good facilitation in person? All of you here facilitate programs. So tell me what is a good facilitation? You can pop it in the chat. You can just speak up to you. Allowing for multiple voices, personal connections with the participants. One more, one more, and then I'll move. 
building rapport. Yes, you got it. Yes, exactly. Of course, I talk about the opening. The opening is not only about setting expectations, but about building that rapport. Yes, moving at a good pace. You have to build that rapport. You have to connect with the participants. And look, when you have 40 people online, it's really hard, really hard because you can see their faces at the same time as you can do in a, in a room. That's why important you have some techniques in place to allow for all those voices to come forward. So first of all, don't be a chill facilitator. You're the boss. When we are facilitating, we're in charge, right? And being in charge means that we are setting the rules to help people connect with each other, learn more, feel at ease. If we, if we are less a fair facilitator, it's gonna be a mess. The louder voices are gonna take over. Um, so you have to create a space. And that means, you know, you might give people two minutes for individual reflection before you send them into the groups. And initially you might do only groups of two uh, or, and then grow into bigger groups once people are comfortable with speaking up in bigger groups, right? And clear, set clear um, rules about when you come back, how you're gonna report, what you're gonna say and how you're gonna take turns. So one of our groups, they came out with this rule themselves that it was gonna be uh, one Australian, one Indonesian every time. So if one Australian sp spoke, then it has to be an Indonesian after because they were conscious because of all the learning we're doing, the Australians were more direct communicators and they found it easier to just speak in a bigger group. And if they were just staying in their comfort zone, there was no room for the others to step up. So that you have to create that. Um, and also keep in mind the group dynamics. And this is something that we want to share with you. And again, you might have seen it before, but if not, it's gonna be helpful for you. This is Bruce Tuckman's model of group development. Um, so every group that spends a certain amount of time together goes through these stages. We've used this in the past with Fran many, many times when we do a one week train the trainer program or a one week intercultural workshop or three weeks, three days even. But we notice it and it, ha it happens every time. But to be honest, we didn't expect it to happen online, but it did. So it does happen online too. So Group spend the first part is forming. So everyone is a bit anxious. Like it's like when you walk into this webinar today, it's like, who am I? Who are the others? How are we gonna connect? You know, I'm not sure what I'm gonna say. You know, your voice is a bit shaky. That's what happens. Um, and then people eventually goes into storming because your real personalities are coming out and the conflict appears and there is a bit of rumble happening. And then the group finds their way to norming. They set their rules, they resettle and then they can perform. And eventually there's a morning because the program is finishing. And this is important in two points. First, what sort of activities do you put in each part of the process? Although it's not like very linear that, oh, day one, this is gonna happen day two, but you can expect something to happen. If you have a five week program in week two, something's gonna happen. And that storm might take the shape of the group against you. <laughs> They're not happy with the program or something is really bad or there was as little detail that all, all the sudden they all got angry about. Uh, or they might be just very subtle that oh, people are not speaking up, it's taking longer to share their thoughts, mm, what's happening there, right? So that's why it's important you have your rules from the beginning so you can revisit the rules and go into norming, right? And you can expect, as I showed you before, we had the internship, and then the social impact project. There is a reason why we had the social impact project later in the process, because we thought that they would be ready to perform by then. By week four, they knew each other, they had the, the rules clear, they knew how to communicate, so they were ready to work together. Mm -hmm. And then in the morning, we allow for reflection, closing up, say thank you, appreciate each other, and a big- Your you tears. Your tears, <laughs> believe it or not. And, and I think too in the storming, one of the things that sometimes happens is it's, it's not conflict as such, it's confusion or uncertainty. You know, it, it's not necessarily a, a hugely negative element, but it is something that, oh, you know, I thought I knew what I was doing and all of a sudden I'm not sure. Or, um, you know, I thought I, you know, was better at this and now I realise I've got a bit more to learn, you know, so it can be a range of things that happen in, in, in that in that component but the real key to managing it apart from having 
uh, plan about the activities is to be super observant. Um, you know, you need to be watching, you need to be listening, you need to be listening and, and interpreting. And where Marcella very rightly said, don't be too chilled um, as a facilitator, um, that's one thing, but you need to balance it with this friendship. And so we developed a close relationship with the participants, which, which enabled them to kind of be open with us. And if they were struggling with something or they were there was something else happening, you know, on the sidelines, then they, they would bring that up. And then we were able to, you know, adjust or to slightly change the timing or to eliminate something if they needed a bit of a break. So I think that high levels of observation of really active listening and engagement is, is critically important. And it's absolutely not at odds with, um, uh, you know, being in charge when you're facilitating, it really goes hand in glove. Yeah. And one thing that I forgot to say, make sure you have two facilitators. So because one can go, you know, looking at the faces <laughs> while the other one is, uh, speaking that's very important uh, and also you know debrief after say oh did you notice any symptoms of anything so good let's keep moving and we'll have more time for questions in a minute and the final price evaluation don't wait don't wait until the end and you know this is in every book about evaluation <laughs> evaluate from beginning to end right so create a baseline that's what we did so we did an, an initial what the expectations were where the intercultural effectiveness was, the level of knowledge about each other's culture or language. And then of course we compare at the end, but we did ongoing check-ins. So every week in different shapes and forms, surveys, during the reflection calls, in a simple way, simple way like this week I learned, I, I loved and I would change, you know, complete these phrases thing. Um, something as simple as that to like a more structured survey. We, we change the way how we did every week, but then be willing to adjust. Like, you know, as soon as you detect that there's something there, make sure you change it. Um, we did that a couple of times during the, the programs and it was magic. <laughs> First of all, it sends a clear message to the participant that it is participant centered, that you are listening to them and you are watching how this is going. Um, and of course, it helps you achieve the outcomes. Um, Fran, I think you were going to say something. No? Oh, okay. oh, I think that's right. I mean, I think the other thing is we did a, a little bit of checking in with individual participants who at different times. So that might just be reaching out on WhatsApp to an individual, just checking how they're going. Very early on, we checked in on, you know, participants who had full time jobs and were still doing the program, you know, just to check how they were uh, participating, uh, how they were tracking. And again, that helps set up the set up the relationship to get effective feedback, as well as being genuinely, you know, uh, concerned that you're not you know, going to, they're not um, being put in a position that they can't manage or that you're, you know, not hearing about it or not um, able to adjust. And in, in fact, we didn't have to do too much adjustment around that at all, but it, it was certainly highly valued. And I think it was all part of that establishing, you know, how relationships are established. And then that helped the participants um, really continue on with that process. So then they started checking in on each other and, and um, you know, that was that was important because remember, this is one of our goals, the relationship um, establishment. Now, of course, your program might not have that as a key element, um, but one would imagine you, well, I believe you need a certain sense of cohesion within the group and relationship across the group to make any program work. Um, of course, we probably took that to the nth degree because that was one of our goals. So Tracy, and did that answer your question? Good, okay, perfect. Okay, we're coming almost to the end, but we still have to share some lessons learned, a bit of a recap. I think that's what's coming next. Yes, Fran. Yeah, so I think, um, and it's fairly self-explanatory. I won't go into any great detail. So we've got a bit of time for questions, but it really is all about you know, we call it plan like hell and then go with the flow. Um, once you start, you know, like be willing to kind of be a bit flexible, but that intentionality, it doesn't come from nowhere. Um, having a common project or task. 
Um, so in our case, the um, social impact um, project was very much this shared activity. If you are doing an uh, exchange from school, for instance, it might be a particular um, topic area that you want to focus on, there needs to be that sense of common purpose, um, or it could be um, part of a course uh, curriculum, for instance, if it was in higher education. It's essential to create a safe environment, um, safe where people really do genuinely feel included. Um, and that's not that hard to do, but you need to be vigilant. Um, choosing communication channels that work for them, not necessarily for you. Um, you know, experience tells us that, you know, young people don't use email really at all. It would be so much easier if they did because that would suit me. Um, but, uh, you know, we needed to adjust to what suited them. Um, and can, can I just say, and so WhatsApp works very well, but emojis in WhatsApp works amazingly. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. I found myself on many occasions asking, what, what does that mean? You know, and what is the difference between this one and that one? So I think they just thought I was, a, you know, a crazy our lady but it also kind of just shows that we're all learning and we were very clear about that you know we were learning through this whole process too um one-stop platform if possible just somewhere to park the stuff um so break the chain we had all the resources the learning uh, modules in a closed facebook group um which was part of their bigger program so there's a elements of units that are located there that was excellent and if your platform can be something that's not an additional thing in their lives um, then that's probably going to be even better than having to you know all of a sudden start with something new remember to design for multicultural groups uh, be very conscious of um, the cultural element of your participants if this is an exchange and you're looking at you know two or more different um Cultural groups, um, of course, even within cultural groups, they're not all the same, but just be mindful, you know, and that could impact on, as we mentioned earlier, communication styles, um, you know, avoidance of conflict, um, you know, interaction, uh, power, you know, the likelihood of speaking up. Be really as conscious as you can be, be aware yourselves that this will have an impact on the group. And of course, that concept of group dynamics, which, which is also related um, to culture, but you know that standard practice of uh, people working together. So kind of almost brings us to the end. What I'd like everyone to think about, is there one thing that you've heard that you would like to apply to your um, practice? Um, one of the key things, of course, for anything, even a short, you know, a little presentation like this one is to kind of go away with um, an action or go away with something you'd like to explore further or ask more questions about. Um, and so I really would encourage you to, um, to think about that, whether you jot it down on your notebook or pop it in the chat, it's completely up to you. But, you know, is there something that you've heard that you think, ah, I could do that? I think this would be, um, could make a difference. Um, we should note, and I know Marcella said it earlier, you know, none of this is completely new, I'm sure, for most of us. But what it is, it's about that application. It's about doing it. The difference between, you know, the stuff that you know works and, and what you actually do often is not the same. So pop it in the chat if you have, um, yeah, the variety of activities and the importance for reflection. Great. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. I think we just any more questions. Sorry. We've got about five minutes left. More explicit about the setting. Yeah, the group well, norms. norms. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Team building online is fun, Satoshi. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah, scratch well, our heads. I've had a, I've had a very very kind of success. So I, I you know delivered to high school students, also some adults as well. And uh, yeah, it's like you know we might accept that we are catering to different kinds of people and different sort of people thrive in the online environment. Uh, and that's I think that's the beauty of that as well. But yeah, it's also very difficult not to I guess uh, be what's the word uh, weighed down by the kind of you know cop out sort of. Uh, 
feedback that we get, you know, oh, face to face would be better. Like they, 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 there's going to be like a percentage of people who say that because it's easy thing to say. And you go to these people and say, okay, why is it better? And then often they got nothing to say, but they say, oh, it's just better. You know? <laughs> and, uh, so, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. It's, mm-hmm. I mean, so, we, so, so we sort of have to learn to kind of ask these sort of questions, but also kind of learn to filter out some of these, uh, we might say, invalid feedback as well. Um, yeah, that's true. And it's interesting, we found with our, you know, with our first um, online group, um, so... We, there was hardly any conversation around like the missing out until probably the very end when then it was about, oh, when can we possibly get together? You know, and I wish I could, you know, I wish I could see you now. Um, so I, I have absolutely no doubt it was in their minds, um, but focus, over-focusing on it, it doesn't help anybody. It just you know, makes you, you know, it's, it just makes you feel like you're losing something when in fact you're gaining something. And one of the interesting things here we found is that one of our um, speakers who were past alumni back a a number of decades uh, was very skeptical um, of, um, you know, this new way of doing thing and how they could possibly um, establish, you know, the same feeling that he had back in the eighties um, when, you know, him and his, you know, buddy got together. And at one point in one of the meetings we were having in preparation for a talk they were doing said, you know what, these guys are learning stuff we never learned. And I said, yay. <laughs> that is true. Um, you know, so it's just different, right? It's, you're learning some different things. You're experiencing something differently, but not necessarily worse. Yeah, well, the high, high results and I were running a forum together last year, and we, we asked a sort of casually question, say, you know, it's just like a, a right at the end of lockdown in uh, Victoria, well, previous lockdown, I should say. And uh, yeah, we just asked basically everybody, there were like 70 odd students in the room, and there were, you know, four forums, but, uh, you know, what, honestly, what do you prefer, uh, you know, online or face to face teaching and, and provided this is online forum, so it's not a representative sample of students, but I'd say about 56, 60% of students actually immediately responded online, which surprised us. Yeah. Um, and that's emotionally speaking, and it's just, I'm, I'm just reflecting on what Fran just said. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty difficult thing for teachers to stomach, I think, because I mean, I'm, I'm a former teacher. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be very sad if my students said that I prefer just learning from home because I want to feel needed. I want to feel legitimate. There's the, a the sort of like institution of school being legitimate and necessary place. You know, that's a discourse that you want to hold on to. So there is that kind of emotional um, bias, I might say, you know, from some of the participants, uh, if, 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 you're, if you're working with teachers. Mm. But that, that's very important. And I want, if anyone has any other questions, please um, speak up or write it on the chat. But that emotional connection that happens online, Satoshi. You know what? Like Fran and I, with, with these groups, you know, we, we can feel the appreciation as if we were in a classroom. So that, that, that can happen. But I, I love that this idea of we need to debunk our own resistance, you know, our own obstacles and, you know, the, the things that we say to ourselves. And I, I said someone mentioned that earlier about that. And it's true, you know, that was the first thing that we had to do. Like, hold on a second, is that possible? Can we do this? Uh, do we have the skills? Like, we are not experts on educational technology. We're not. Um, but then, yes, when we, once we got our head around and understanding, okay, wait, the same principles, the principles apply, right? Um, then is a the question, how do you deliver and connect it to your goals? But um, the principles do apply. And that's what surprises that, surprised us about how come the results of the intercultural effectiveness scales was better than the in-person? And if you think about it, it's like, well, the in-person, we are assuming that because there are two months in Indonesia, they're developing the skills. There wasn't as much intentional reflection and, and guidance and facilitation as it was online. And, and the results, you, you can see that like surprise everyone, right? So anyway, any other questions? I'm wondering about the scalability of it. What you think is an ideal group size for something like this online where um, you have breakout rooms and things like that too? Mm-hmm. Max 40. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, yeah. Well, we just had two groups that basically 40, so 36 and 40. Um, I think we're looking at a fairly similar number um, with the Japanese program as well. Um, 
it, it's it's doable. Um, you can you can retain that personal connection. You feel like you know everyone individually. I think that's probably important. I think you could have considerably less and still be effective, but not too small a group. You know, so you know probably around fifteen to twenty would be the you know maybe at the bottom end of the scale. Um, and I think if you get beyond, you know, being able to connect. Well, you know, 40 is two screens yeah. of Zoom. <laughs> you know, I don't think you want to get onto multiple screen, you know, screens <laughs> of Zoom, not a, not a good thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So look, we wanted to just finish up by, look, thanking you for joining us. Um, and just to, very, to reiterate that value learning, we're very committed, um, as you probably, you know, gained um, to advancing global competence um, and helping people understand intercultural understanding better um, and recognising the importance that plays in all kinds of programs. But these are the things that we do, um, you know, consult, we work on program design, we work in consultation with others. Um, and we also do some work around professional development. And we'd be very keen um, to talk to anyone who um, is interested in learning more about that. Um, and from time to time, we have you know, some set programs that we run. And at other times, um, it's very much tailored to the needs of the individuals. But we do feel that we've got you know, decades now of experience and increasing experience in this virtual space. And let's hope that you know, virtual becomes a choice as opposed to a necessity um, as we go on. And, and my guess is that as we move even back into face-to-face -face, um, um, exchange at some point in the future, there'll be elements of what we learned in this virtual space that will carry on into the new space. It just seems like the, the learning was so significant, it's absolutely worth it. Um, not to replace, but to enhance. So thank you, everyone. Thank um, you, everyone. And if you, I think Yvette, if you want to connect with us to just feel free to reach out to our emails, you know where to find us. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.